Hey, good morning, everyone in U.S. not U.S. history, but history of the United States Constitution. I'm just going to put up a little chapter discussion, if you will, of, of chapter one from the textbook I've asked you to get. And again, it's the words we live by by Linda Monk. We really don't get into too much substantive. Um, well, if you're thinking about testable material until chapter uh, really two, which goes into Article One, the Congress, but. She does do a decent job in chapter one, not only talking about the preamble to the Constitution and why it, it has meaning and relevance to our understanding of the document, but it also talks about the lack of um, strength or utility that the Articles of Confederation have, which was our first Constitution. It failed after five, six years, roughly, because it was just a loose confederation of independent states and 13 colonies, kind of nations in and of themselves. So let, let us very led us in a very, or led to us having a very weak um, form of existence vis-a-vis -vis foreign intrigue. Foreign governments might be able to capitalize on our unification or lack of unification, as well as our own inherent internal affairs were starting to really uh, fall apart. Lack of consistency in currency, regulation of commerce, the raising of tax revenue for the necessary means to keep society stabilized. Um, so I think the book is excellent, and that's why the first assignment or two really, really is related to the fundamental philosophical underpinnings from the British Constitution, the British common law, and how those influenced the thinkers of our own forefathers when they crafted the United States Constitution. And one of the articles I read that I thought were, was fantastic was really suggesting it's a very conservative rebellion because what they were really demanding was equal treatment or traditional treatment under the British system that they felt like they weren't getting. Other members of the empire were getting representation in parliament. We didn't have direct representation. They thought virtual representation was enough. We decried that. We felt local rule was essential. And if the rule is coming from Great Britain, we should at least be able to partake in it through representation in a real sense, members of our community would go and represent our interests. They said virtual representation was satisfactory, meaning that even though you may have a rep from Liverpool or from Yorkshire or one of the other areas of Great Britain, those members of the parliament would represent your interests over in the colonies. So anyways, we know we broke away. We know all of these factors went into it. There was a lot of self-rule going on. There was an expectation of the rights of man that was passed in Great Britain in the 1600s and the Magna Carta in the 1200s that limited government authority. We liked that. We wanted to have it incorporated in a written constitution. What do we know about the British constitution? It's not written in its entirety. Sections of art are like the Magna Carta, like the uh, rights of man that were, that were developed later giving fundamental rights to all citizens of the empire, like the right to a jury trial, the right to petition the government, and, and, and uh, the right to free, well, free speech actually comes much later in our own society. But those fundamental rights were going to become inherent in our nation's history, and we wanted them somehow incorporated in a written document that was complete. And if it was flawed, if it didn't work, we'd have a mechanism to change it without, well, armed rebellion. There's an inherent ability to rebel via the voting um, box and in the constitutional amendment process. So anyways, I think she does a great job after the adoption of the Constitution in terms of what it means. But we had to talk a little bit about why we led up to where we did. I'm going to post an excellent video that comes, I believe it's from the Annenberg study of the Constitution. They did a very nice and I think entertaining um, discussion of when the framers went down to Philadelphia to fix the Articles of Confederation, threw it out the window. So we're starting with a new government from scratch. They had some models to work off, and that was state governments, as well as much of the British government would be adopted in terms of its conception would be part of it. it, it, it a lot of people think our forefathers went down there with a clean slate and adopted a whole full new form of government that never existed before. What was new about it, what was novel, is that the power emanated from the people, and that's what the preamble starts with. The preamble to the Constitution isn't the law itself, doesn't dictate the framework of government, but it introduces its purpose and its sort of its salutary goals or its beneficial goals, and that's why it starts off with we the people. They really want to emphasize that Governor Morris, I always thought Governor Morris was the governor of some state, that's why they call him Governor Morris. That's actually his first name with a slightly altered spelling, but it's Governor Morris. Um, was the uh, wordsmith behind the Constitution, but it was Madison that was the architect, and the other members obviously contributed a lot too. So we're down there in Philadelphia, 
and they want to come up with language for a new constitution that's going to do what? Grant a great deal more power to the federal government or the central government. States wouldn't necessarily want to do that, especially the smaller states, because if representation was going to be based upon population, the larger states were going to prevail. So they came up with those great compromises, which we went over previously in my previous video and materials and articles that I put up uh, for assignment one. But for assignment two, I'm going to ask you to talk and, and discuss something about not only the preamble, but also this other document that doesn't seem to be getting mentioned too much. It's not a legal document in the sense that it helps us interpret the Constitution. It's more of a document of philosophy and a document of grievances. And that's our Declaration of Independence. We celebrate it every 4th of July. You know, arguably it was first written in the 2nd of July. We're not going to get into those semantics for trivia pursuit. But the Declaration of Independence is just that. It's a political document that serves two purposes. One is declaring our independence so foreign nations might be able to support us. We might get foreign aid and allegiances against Great Britain during the time of our Revolutionary War. And it starts off with that classic line um, for the pursuit of uh, the third clause I always find most, most amazing, but it's um, certain unalienable rights are given to all human beings. And when those rights are deemed to be transgressed or to be um, not available through its government form, the right to revolution and throw off that yoke of tyranny is inherent in the people. So the recognition that sovereignty rests and comes up through the people it, it stems right in our uh, Declaration of Independence. But we know that famous clause that all men are created equal with certain unalienable rights, the right to life, liberty, and in the Declaration of Independence, they say, in the pursuit of happiness. What's interesting about the pursuit of happiness, I always make fun of that, or maybe not make fun of a comment on it. Why isn't it the attainment of happiness? That's because there's no such thing as attaining it. It's like catching an eel. It's often slipping away from you, and you have to recapture it for brief moments as of handling, because happiness is fleeting. Um, but that's a philosophical approach I believe in. But what it is is really almost the language of John Locke and Thomas Hobbes, these British philosophers, and others that were influencing not only members of Great Britain society, but us as colonists. We were British society too. And instead of it would be life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, it was really life, liberty, and the protection of property interests. But that doesn't sound romantic and um bold in terms of a political philosophy. It almost sounds, you know, kind of selfish and greedy and a little overly too capitalistic. But that's the foundation in which the political philosophy was. Life, to be lived freely from tyranny. Liberty, obviously inherent in that. It's duplicitous of the first clause. But the protection of personal property. It's always been the political philosophy of our framers that the protection of property rights is essential in order to maintain a civil society, that has personal freedoms at its roots. The identity that government would protect and preserve personal property rights. Doesn't sound very romantic, does it? But the second tier, uh, so the first tier is the political philosophy of the uh, Declaration of Independence, the right to self-government. The second one is the list of grievances. And basically saying, hey, Great Britain, here's why we had to break away. Here's based upon that political philosophy, because you're screwing us on this aspect, the right of representation, taxation without representation, uh, other things dealing with trade imbalances and taking away a right to jury trials and the right to due process and excessive bail and unusual punishment, all those things that we adopt in our constitution later on. But why do we care about the Declaration of Independence other than a beautifully written document? It also shows some inconsistency in our history because we know when we say all men are created equal, we weren't talking about all men actually. We're talking about all men of a landed class of a certain degree of wealth and certainly white men only. We didn't include women, we didn't include Native Americans, and we certainly didn't include African Americans. In fact, they weren't even deemed Americans until after the passage of the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution, 18. 68. And so there's a long history of hypocrisy, if you will, on some level. But the good news is the document is kind of healing process built right in. That's the amendment process. And we've done that through over time. Um, but I was surprised that the book doesn't talk, the textbook, if you have gotten it yet, but you'll get it soon. It's an easy read. It's a very enjoyable read. That the first chapter talking about the sort of the birth of the nation in terms of the Constitution doesn't really reference the Declaration of Independence. And I think it should, not because the Declaration of Independence contains any legal standards in it, but it does help us make argument or make interpretation of the meaning of the Constitution by knowing what we wanted to frame as a national philosophical foundation. And that's found in the Declaration of Independence. So I'll post it up on the webpage, the Declaration of Independence, but I'm also going to post the Constitution. Hey, it's in your book too. You can access it anywhere. But the one I'm going to put up 
is from the Cornell Law Institute. Uh, Cornell's a, they got a law school. It's a very good law school. But what I like about what they've done is not only do they post the Constitution, they they give it with some annotations, some descriptive information about the history of different clauses, and they'll even put up some of the original language and how it's been amended over time and why. And it's very, very well written. It's not just some, you know, Yahoo character out there in some blog saying this is what the Constitution means or this is how it evolves. It's really from true constitutional experts and um, scholars that help you see the purpose behind the different clauses and how it's changed over time and how it's been interpreted by the courts. And we're going to get to it in later chapters. The courts play a very critical role in how we interpret and how we uh, apply the United States Constitution throughout time. So the preamble, we the people, why is that so important? This is kind of the, I guess, the little homework assignment you get after you read that first chapter, which is a very short chapter, is the framers of the Constitution, when they went down to um, Philadelphia to amend the Articles of Confederation in 1787, not always perfect on dates. Neither should you be. You want to know the general themes and the general timelines. But we had this, the Articles of Confederation from 1781, the first continental Congress, when we got around to passing it. What were we? We were basically 13 independent countries. We recognized that didn't work because of trade competitions, currency problems. We could have just amended it, but there was a recognition that there was a lot of inherent flaws in the Articles of Confederation. It was too fundamentally loose in order for us to survive either from foreign intrigue or from just internal combustion. And so they came away, not with a new government at Philadelphia in 1887, but a new proposal. And the film I'm going to show, which is excellent, leaves us just like most of us when we were taught in school, in grade school, I mean, what the Constitutional Convention did was they created this new constitution and bells were ringing in Philadelphia. And, hey, we got a new government. And we lived happily ever after. We know we didn't. The constitution was flawed and we actually fought the civil war over some flaws that were built within the United States Constitution. Another major legal and sometimes armed conflicts really developed over, you know, we've had civil rights violence in this country because of recognitions of great wrongs that were inherently flawed in the Constitution much later on. Good news is we've come so much further in terms of correcting things that were denial of equity and equality and, and, and the Constitution has fixed it. People say, well, the Civil War fixed it. The Civil War was the tool, the actual repair, the actual correction was done in the Constitution. So, the preamble, we the people, why is that so important? The framers were, Governor Morris was fantastic in this. After they come out of Philadelphia, we don't have a new constitution. We have a proposal for a new constitution. And again, I think I went over this in the first little video summary I put up. They pass it around to the states, not all at once, but the states were supposed to have special conventions and you couldn't be a member sitting in your state representative body. You couldn't be part of your state government if you voted. They wanted new citizens selected from all the different towns and counties in every state and they would go sit usually at their state capital. Uh, Massachusetts, I think we had over 340 uh people going to vote on whether we should adopt this new constitution or reject it. And it came very, very close. I think it was in two or three percentage points of, of actually failing. And everyone that was observing it during that era, if you saw the newspapers and the letters getting passed uh, back and forth, Massachusetts was a linchpin. If Massachusetts voted in favor of it, it likely would become an adopted uh, constitution for the new country. If it, uh, failed Massachusetts, it would it would fail the nation. And and there's probably some truth in it. The way Massachusetts, so goes the nation. That's a slogan for every state that I hear about. And I hear about it from Maine and other states as well too. But at this time, at the constitutional adoption, it was true. But again, it wasn't the state legislators doing this. And I'm going to give away the homework assignment right now. Who was it? Well, why, why did they do that? Well, one is they did want the new government to be chosen by the people, a true grassroots thing. And it was such a novel concept. It wasn't flowing down from a king or a very powerful legislature or state legislatures that are more powerful than the common person going to make the decision. It was what we think of as a common person in that era, people, the landed class of white males, would determine whether or not to adopt this or not by having state constitutional conventions and not the state governments voting on it. But it's much wiser than that. I mean, wiser in a Machiavellian like angle sense is that if you were going to recognize what we were moving from, states were independent nations, to states giving up much of their sovereignty, sovereignty meaning power, independent self-governance, to a outside, if you will, national government, you'd be giving up an awful lot. You'd have to be very altruistic as a state senator, a state rep, or a governor if you were going to endorse such a plan because you're obviously reducing your own role in terms of your influence and your power. 
So it was twofold. One is they wanted the people to decide whether or not they were going to adopt this new constitution. But the other was avoiding state government approval because state governments don't want to give up their power. It's human nature, right? You don't want to give up all that prestige and the power and the control that you once had. So they left it up to the people. And again, I think I have a, I just, I apologize, I've got my phone, but I keep notes on my phone quite a bit now, catching up with my kids in terms of recognize the power of, um, or maybe not the power, but the, the reality of having these phones. And uh, I think I have it right here. Nope. I found my friend's obituary. Um, where was it? It's right here, and I know I mentioned it in a previous video. But the vote in Massachusetts was 187 in favor of adopting the new federal constitution, the constitution we have today, with new amendments, obviously, to 168. 187 to 168. That's tight. Very close election. And it was like that in other states as well. But we needed nine out of the 13 states was the, was the deal. Everyone agreed on that. And uh, nine states, eventually all 13 states signed on. Now we have the United States of America under the new constitution. It was still considered the United States of America under the Articles of Confederation. So if I ask you a test question, what was our first constitution we were recognized as a nation under? It's the Articles of Confederation. It just didn't work well enough. Some people still think it's the great idea. We should be a state centric society. People like even members of the United States Supreme Court, that Justice Rehnquist, who's now dead, was a big believer in states' rights, but so is um, he graduated from Holy Cross. Point, I should know his name pretty well. Um, Justice, um, what's referenced in your book? Justice, um, it's terrible. I keep thinking of only onset dimension. It's a scary thing because I can see him right now. Um, believe that it's really the state, the people of each state, determined whether or not uh, the constitutional existence, states' rights are so very much essential. And why can't I remember his name? And it's terrible. I can see him right in my face. Uh, Justice Thomas, Justice Clarence Thomas, who went to Holy Cross right here in Massachusetts. Um, he believes it's the states endorsed this document, and it's the states that gave the federal government the power. The framers and Justice John Marshall, the greatest justice we ever had, said in its early inception, he was part of the revolution, um, said, no, 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 it's the people that ordained and established this new form of government. And that's what makes it unique. It really is a people-centric document. And the people control it. And the people have the power over it. So the power doesn't rest in the legislature. The power doesn't rest in the presidency. The power doesn't rest in the military. It doesn't rest in the courts. And I know many of you will argue about that. But the reality is it rests in his direction right from the people, and the people have just as much power to alter or change the course. And that's pretty impressive. And what do we call that? We call that popular sovereignty. That's a test question. I, I, I don't know why I focus on we focus on learning, but you know, you got to talk about we the people and what it means. We the people, sovereignty has to rest from somewhere. That means the power to make decisions and control outcomes. And when it's popular sovereignty, that means power from the people. That sounds kind of corny from like a 1960 slogan, but that's what it is. We know there's no independent legal right in that preamble where it outlines the goals of government. So it's a more perfect union. We had a flawed union, so we want to create a more perfect union. But the next clause, to establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our prosperity is just a political statement. People have sued over that, and they cite a famous case from 1905 out of Massachusetts. Somebody was citing over being required to take smallpox and uh, vaccinations in Massachusetts at the turn of the previous century, and uh, they were citing the preamble in the Supreme Court, and it's been held ever since, that the preamble itself doesn't contain inherent rights. But why do we still care about it? Well, what if we're trying to define another right, maybe found in the First Amendment or in one of the bodies of the Articles or in the Fourth Amendment or the Eighth Amendment, whatever it is, one could say, well, why do you think that means that? What historical proof do you have? That's how the Constitution needs to be interpreted. You can sometimes look at a preamble, and it's still argued to this day, though. The Declaration of Independence is argued when we're trying to find meaning when there's a vacuum, lack of clarity in some of the parts of the Constitution. We argue it to the courts because the courts are going to be the arbiter of what the Constitution actually means unless we amend the document, which is rare. And so when we argue in front of the courts, we sometimes talk about the Declaration of Independence. We talk about the Federalist Papers, which were designed to sell the adoption of the Constitution. And sometimes we even talk about the Anti-Federalist arguments to show that that's what the 
country was trying to avoid those certain arguments that came up. So therefore, to be consistent with the intent of the framers. And then there's other people that argue that, well, who cares what the intent of the framers were? What's the document mean today for the needs of today? And you can argue that from the preamble. You can say things like, well, domestic tranquility. In order to have domestic tranquility, this law should be found unconstitutional or constitutional because it serves that fundamental purpose. And therefore, the powers of Congress should be read to be inclusive of that. So getting way off track, but we're trying to figure out how do we figure out what this document means. It sounds so beautiful, right? Domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, provoke the general welfare, secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and prosperity, meaning the future. Problem is we can't get a real tangible meaning from that. And many of us, we live in a pluralist society. And many of you will have different philosophical views about what those salutary, I think we all agree, salutary goals, but one person may say the general welfare is real basic fundamentals, you know, avoiding crime in the streets and making sure we have, you know, paved roadways and travel ways. Other people's may mean, oh, it must be a basic amount of money so you can survive. It must mean public housing. It must mean a public funding of, of education all the way through college. It must mean health care. And, and, and that's the point is because of that divergence in views, we have to look more specifically at the body of the articles itself, but we still should look at the preamble sometimes for thematic residence, if you will. To ordain and establish, we talk about this, and again, it was the people back in the States. I'm just looking for other things. Oh, and I love this guy. People get confused between these two people, Thoroughgood Marshall and John Marshall. I remember I was uh, asked out on a, a thing, and, and do, there's a new movie about your favorite justice, uh, Justice Marshall. Well, I can't wait to go see it. And I thought it was about John Marshall because John Marshall is my favorite justice in the Supreme Court history because he really framed the power of the court. And it turned out to be a movie about Thurgood Marshall, another man that I admire greatly. And I think he's a fantastic justice, but they're from completely different eras. In fact, Justice Marshall only passed away maybe the past uh, 15 years ago or something like that. But Thurgood Marshall is the first African-American man we ever had on the Supreme Court. And prior to becoming a justice, he worked for the uh, NAACP, and he was one of the advocates for um, equality in the school system. He was made famous as an attorney for advocating in the um, Brown versus the Board of Education in Topeka, Kansas, trying to argue that the segregation of the school system was fundamentally flawed under a constitution. And he said the Constitution out of the bat was completely flawed. It was only designed for relatively wealthy or at least middle class white men. And everybody else was excluded in terms of rights and in terms of participation. And the guy's right. The guy is right. But here's the thing where he's now and he knows he, and he acknowledges it in his own lifetime. We've come so far. We've gotten African-Americans are not only able to vote, but they're citizens of the United States. I mean, that sounds like it should have been a non-starter from the beginning, but it wasn't. Slavery was actually protected in the original Constitution uh, for at least a period of time. Women certainly were denied the right to vote, and also poor people and non-property-owning people. Now we know we live in a more democratic society than we ever have. Basically, you just have to be 18 years. There's not even an intelligence test uh, or anything else. And I'm not going to get into the whole thing about whether or not there's voter fraud or not voter fraud, but let's assume you are who you say you are, you're 18, you're a citizen of the United States, you can participate in um, any federal election uh, when, when they come around. So, um, and, I, and I like it here, he says right here, the constitution was defected from the get-go, uh, requiring several amendments, a civil war, momentous social transportation, uh, transformation to attain the system of constitutional government that really respects individual freedoms and human rights that we hold fundamental today. Well, you can disagree with me, you can agree, but the fact is we have changed the document significantly to be much more applicable to a much broader class of people. It's still shocking to me that it's only been 101 years. 101 year, is, yeah, years and multiple. Um, that women have had the right to vote. And women were often the catalyst for changes to end slavery and to end other human um inequalities, yet they were often delayed in their own um, civil attainment of civil rights. But that's chapter one, sort of in a nutshell, the kind of introduction to why we had a flawed system, how we're trying to crank, and what the purpose of the Constitution all found in the preamble. Not a lot of homework out of this chapter, but people are just getting the book. People are going to just start reading it. But watch this little, not my video necessarily, but watch this other little video. It's even less time than I'm going to put up. And it's fantastic, but not giving you that last bit of information that after they left Philadelphia in 1787, they pass it around the states for 
um, voting. And it was a close call between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. And quite frankly, I think the Federalists were on the right side of history. We needed a strong central government to side. But I think the Anti-Federalists were actually right in their prediction that the federal government would become very, very powerful in states' rights, in state sovereignty would be very much diminished as a result of adopting the new federal constitution. And history has shown that that's exactly what happened. I'll leave you with those thoughts and otherwise um, have a good day. Stay well.